Mark chapter 5. And they came over on the other side, just like Jesus told them in verse 35, previous chapter. The sea into the country of Gadareas. Gadareans. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Again, it's never devil possession. Well, some say it. A demon is a word that could be good or bad, according to the dictionary and beliefs. So Jesus gets out of the boat, and here comes a man that is possessed. And we're going to see some traits of devil possession, but be careful because some of these traits could be other diseases. But with this man here, when you put them all together in one man, it's definitely devil possession. So he comes from the tombs, the graveyard. There's nothing wrong going to a graveyard. A lot of people take their dogs to go walk there. It's a creepy place. Who had his dwelling among the tombs. He lived there. He lived in the graveyard. And slept. No man could bind him. No, not with chains. Unmerciful strength. That this guy could not be tamed. Now you got to be careful too because there are cops who will tell you that when certain people are under certain illegal drugs, with the power of that drug does something to their body, they can break handcuffs. But they're not devil possessed. But then again, they're being ruled by another spirit. And it's not their spirit. There's something about alcohol and drugs that just makes a man worse than he is. Now I'm not saying everyone that does drugs and alcohol or devil possessed, but there's something there. Because that he had been often bound with fetters. That's like a, a foot cuff. Instead of a handcuff, a foot. And you've seen pictures of you've seen pictures of you know you see in the cartoons a ball and chain around the guy's leg. And chains. So this fetter had chains or probably a ball kind of thing attached to it. And the chains had been plucked asunder by him. You put a chain on his leg to keep him bound. And he just took that chain and plucked it right off. Great strength. And the fetters were broken in pieces. There was nothing that could hold him. Neither could any man tame him. He's just a wild, satanic being. Not the kind of person you want to come home. Not the kind of person you want in your city or township. So he's unwanted. Only place he's got is the tombs. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains. High places. Mountains where they went and worship other gods. Tower of Babel. Get to God on man's own barrack. Skyscrapers. Launching spaceships. The space shuttles. And in the tombs. In the tombs. The mausoleums. The buildings. Crying. Now people cry. You're not devil possessed. Again, I said, when you take all these into one account of this one man and cutting himself with stones, you see that over in the Asian countries. The Roman Catholic Church will have them cut themselves, kneel on glass, walking upstairs, making, making themselves bleed for penance. Now, I'm going to say, as far as that goes, with a religion... I guarantee that's devil possession. No one in their right mind would go and force themselves to be, I can't say the word, mutilated for, for a God. Because nowhere does God tell you to do that. If you if you read and they, they do magazines, if you were to study something like that and see pictures, here's these people over here, the penance, they call it. I guarantee that would be devil possession, no, no matter how you look at it. And then you're getting the realms of uh, tattooing. And the tattoo is not done with stones, but you're cutting yourself in printing marks. And that's where the law says you weren't to do that. You're not to 
to press yourself in cutting. Now, I'm a diabetic. I've got to test my sugar regularly. In order to do that, I got to take a needle thing and prick my fingers. Well, am I devil possessed because I prick myself, make myself bleed? No, it's a medical condition. So you got to be careful how you diagnose these things. There are some people out there, some really, you know, you're, you know, call, call a priest and you got to be very careful. And watch this. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. James 2.19 A person that is possessed will acknowledge Jesus Christ as God, according to James and Matthew and Mark so far that we've seen. And I've dealt with the street ministry. I've dealt with some people that you wonder. And yet they're so quick to acknowledge Jesus Christ. Americans will, oh, I know Jesus. I'm a Christian. Really? Your actions don't prove it. This guy walks up to him with all the things, all the things that these town people can say about it. Yeah, I know you, Jesus. The town people wouldn't say, really? And cried with a loud voice. Another devil possession, but people have loud voices. And yet there are religions that try to imitate that loud voice purposely to get in the spirit. That would be satanic. But if you got a loud voice like me, many people may think I'm devil possessed, but I'm not. I've got a gift of God to be loud. And said, what have I? Now this would be the devil speaking to Jesus, not the guy. What have I? To do with thee Jesus thou son of the most high God well devils this is not the guy this is the devils according to James 2 9 they are acknowledging who Jesus Christ is <clears throat> now who would be witnessing this event the disciples right yet don't you read everywhere they just haven't had a clue they're, they're standing there, the 12 of them, maybe more, are standing there. Here's this guy. I mean, you can just imagine what this guy looks like. He probably stinks. He's probably hairy. He's probably just viciously looking mean. And he's probably talking and not even opening his mouth and acknowledging who this man is that they've been following. We've never been here. And they don't get the clue of who Jesus really is. But the devils know. I adjure thee by God. You know, if you were to take a devil and bring him into a courtroom and lay before his hand a Bible and say, Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? He will say, I swear by God. I adjure thee by who? Satan? No. I adjure thee by Lucifer? No. Who do the devils turn when it comes to the highest honor? God. How is that? And unlike man, even if they possess who God is, they can never be saved. My life before I would say I was devilish and, and just carnal and anti-God and anti-Jesus. But that day when I met God at Calvary, I repented of my sin. I got right and I became a son of God. I had hope and I got hope today. No devil, no angel that went after Satan ever has that hope. They're forever damned. That thou torment me not. There's a place in Jude that says the angels are, are bound. The angels are going to end up in a lake of fire. And what they're thinking right now, oh, you're here to do that now. And he's not. So, and other couple places where they say something like that to Jesus, you got to wonder, they know their end is coming. Yet, yeah, but they don't know when. And they think that Jesus now here walking in the flesh, oh, this is it. 
So the devils in hell acknowledge Jesus Christ coming. They just got the wrong time. This is the first time. This is not the second time. This devil thinks this is the second advent of Jesus Christ. He's coming to destroy all. To take Satan and bound him for a thousand years. So I would probably think this is assumed to say that once Satan is bound for the thousand years, all the devils are cast into, the, into hell. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. So Jesus said, come out of him, and he gives him a little, oh, man, I know. Man. And he asked him, what is thy name? Now, why would Jesus have to do that? He knows. But remember, he's got 13 men with him. 14, I think Matthew says it's two of them. He's got his disciples, and he's got these two men here. He's doing it for a witness. He wants these devils to possess, what's that? To profess themselves before the human witnesses. He's telling his disciples, this is who we're dealing with right now. And he's going to tell you. What is thy name? And he answered and said, my name is Legion. Great number. Military force. Ever hear the foreign legion? It's a military force. For we are many. <clears throat> and he besought him. The, the devil besought him. One speaks up for all this legion. Besought him much that he would not send them away into the country. I don't know. He wanted to stay in the Gadarene area. Something about maybe that cemetery. He didn't want to go anywhere else. He's a dead spirit, so he probably likes the dead atmosphere. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding unclean animals, according to the Levitical law. Not unclean to us, but to the Jews, unclean. And all the devils besought, all, look at that. You had one devil speaking, now all the devils speak up. Don't you think that was freaky? You ever, ever watch horror, horror movies? In that moment when that, that voice speaks like it's multiple voices echoing. All the devils besought him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter into them. So for a devil... The next best thing to man, let me go in a pig. That speaks highly of a man. And yet Peter tells us the swine is a type of female deceiver. The dog type of male deceiver. I don't know what other things could have been there, but they say that we'll, we'll take those pigs. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. Into them. Forthwith, Jesus gave them leave, military leave. As they turned, like, go ahead, granted. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. So this legion could fit into about 2,000 pigs, hogs. And the, the, the entrance of those devils caused those pigs to go haywire. And they went and committed hogicide. That's a random joke that always works in this chapter. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. Here's your news. On the spot, live, camera. And they went out to see what it was that was done. Well, they show up and there's a bunch of dead pigs lying around. On the shore, floating. In the water. They come to Jesus. Makes you one of the people that were kept. They saw the whole thing. They ran right to Jesus. Even the Pharisees there for a while. You know, They, they go to other people. They go to the side. These guys walk up right to Jesus. 
and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid instant conversion instant being right and it caused fear they know this guy. They probably feared this. They probably tried to keep the swine away from this area. They probably would walk all the way around this area to avoid this man. And they look at him now like, how's he going to act now? Looks civilized, but is he? And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil so what jesus did was not only witnessed by the twelve and the two men like i said matthew says two of them but the people that were feeding the swine taking care of them witnessed this whole thing so they're close enough to know what had happened probably heard the conversation maybe too i don't know Wouldn't that draw you closer to Jesus? Yet it draws them further. Why? Remember one of the things we learned in the last chapter? What is it? The, the, something the riches and lust? Well, watch what happens. And also concerning the swine. All right, let's get our eyes off the man. Now let's put our thoughts on commerce, the pork belly market. We're not going to be able to sell that bacon. I know you can get deviled ham, but no one's going to buy that ham. Jesus, you just killed 2,000 hogs that we could have sold for a holiday ham to the Gentiles, of course. Jesus, healed a man of Satan. And broke someone else's pocketbook. And the people that witness whole, this whole event are more upset of their pocketbook than seeing this man get right. And businesses today, if you work for a company, they will yell at you for witnessing and talking about Jesus because you might offend our customers. Or our fellow employee and we can't have that never mind getting people saved and getting right and you know Christians live look, supposed to live better lives than the unsaved but you know you, you're gonna ruin our profit we don't want it and they began to pray him look, look, at, look at the word that the Holy Spirit used there didn't say ask pray him to part out of their cup Jesus get out of here just, just leave. And so what's Jesus do? Does he plead with them? Does he, oh, we should work this out. Oh, God is love. And when he was come into the ship, he, okay, you want me to leave? Bye. See ya. You know why sometimes your family, your friends, your co-workers won't get saved as you pray for them? Because they told Jesus, get out of here. And Jesus, okay, bye. Unless we got to pray the earnest. You ask Jesus to come, he'll come. You tell Jesus to leave, he'll leave. Be careful, Christian, in your life. Don't ever tell Jesus to leave. He that had been possessed with the devil prayed him. Verse 17, they pray him, he's praying. It's the same earnest expectation. Get out of here, Jesus. And this man's like, I got nothing more but to be with you, Jesus. Prayed him that he might be with him. I want to be with you, Jesus. I'm tired of the tombs. I'm tired of the, your life. Can I be with you now, Jesus? I'll be your 13th disciple. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not. But saith unto him, Go home to thy friends. 
to tell them how great things the Lord has done for them. He doesn't have to open up his mouth. What, just coming into his city, imagine. They're all probably fear. You know, you ever see one of those Western movies? This bad guy comes in. Everybody goes in, locks up, closes all the windows. You know, this guy walks in the city, into his hometown. They're like, oh, no, grab the little children, take them off the street. Wait a minute. He's dressed. He's not foaming. He's shaking hands. He's having a conversation. That's testament. Well, what happened to you, brother? Ten-step program? No, Jesus came into my life. What the Lord had done unto thee, and had and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Diapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Now look at that. You know, you know how to really believe someone got saved according to the Bible? For with the heart man believes on the righteous, with the mouth confession on the salvation. If you don't start witnessing after your conversion, now you may fall away as we read in the parable in, cha in chapter 4. Other things may get in the way of the work. But if you don't immediately start witnessing, that's Bible doctrine. And when Jesus had passed over again by ship unto the other side, so he goes back across the river, I mean the sea, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue. Now the synagogue was a building where they met. The rulers are people who were in charge of that synagogue, in charge of the people. Be like a deacon. You know, Somebody needs to pay the, they didn't have electric bills, but someone had to pay the electric bill. Somebody had to clean the ground. This guy would be in charge of that thing. So he's in charge of this synagogue. Probably a place where Jesus visited, maybe. Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And he got down in all fours. He beheld the feet of Jesus that will soon have scars. Jairus can tell me what Jesus' feet looked like before he was nailed to the cross for my sins. How's that? Later on, the disciples are going to tell us what it looked like. To, cause they said they beheld him by his feet. The same place where Jairus is. The disciples are going to be held those same feet that had the nail holes. The feet that I will see one day. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. It's helplessness. I pray thee. Look at that pray again. Look how earnest they were to get rid of him. How earnest this guy was to be with Jesus. This guy, his daughter is going to die. Tell me what that word prayer means. Prayer is serious. Say a prayer. No, it's serious communications with God. Prayer. I pray thee, and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. He believes it. Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him, bumping him, pushing him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, Leviticus 15, 19. Uh, yeah, 15, 25 to 31. She's bleeding. I don't know what kind of blood. 12 years. That's a lot of blood loss. Probably weak. Doesn't say how much blood. And has suffered many things of the physicians. It's funny to hear Luke record this thing. Because he's a doctor. Mark, one of the disciples, say, you know what? She spent a lot on doctors. And had spent all that she had. Now remember Jesus told us. If you're sick you need to go to a doctor. But she like Asa sought the doctors without God. And got no results. You got to seek God and the doctors. And you know what? The doctors may not be able to help you anyway. Me and a friend I know with diabetes have gone through that. The doctors haven't been able to do nothing. But we went to God. And spent all that she had. That's 2016. There are people spending all they have on doctors to get a healing. Nothing's changed, has it? Like Jesus said, you'll have the poor with you always. There's poor everywhere. 
We're in a sin cursed world. And it causes diseases that you will never get healed of. Except for the mercy and grace of God. And it was nothing better but rather grew worse. So she's getting worse and worse and worse. And had Jesus not come on the scene, she probably may have died of this bleeding. If it's getting worse and worse and worse. I don't know how. I don't know if she's bleeding more and more or whatever it is. I have no idea. We're not told. But the condition is getting worse. It could be getting terminal. And when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. Proverbs 29, 25. Now, Jesus has been rumored all about. What she probably heard is, here he is. He's on the streets right now. He is in the same place where she is. Finally, that man Jesus is here. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. So she's thinking, listen, I don't need to talk to him. Just his clothes. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. Luke 8, 44. And she felt in her body she was healed of that play. So, and Luke says staunched. It stopped. No more flowing of blood. Healing. Because she believed Jesus could do it. Now she had only gone to God before. I have 31 AD. She may have been. It may have been 11 years if she going to G because he's been in this area before. But you know your last copay, next copay. Now I'm out of copay. I can't pay no more. Okay, fine. We can't do nothing for you. And yeah, it's my wife. We just had a doctor do that to us. But you go to Jesus. Uh. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue, power, had gone out of him, turned him about in the press, the group of people, and said, who touched my clothes? Now he knew that, didn't he? Genesis 3, 9, when God's carrying a conversation on with, with Adam, he knew what Adam did, didn't he? He said to Eve, what didst thou? Didn't he know what Eve did? Cain, what'd you do? You know what he wants? He wants this woman to come up and say, It's me. This is what happened. And all the deep. You know what God wants from you? Even after you said, He wants you to come up to him and say, This is what I did. And I'm sorry. It's me. It's my fault. It's my sin nature. It's who I am. Lord, I'm sorry. And the Lord, the Bible said, yeah, I knew that. I'm just waiting for you to say something. You see how merciful God is? He wants us to say something. He wants us to confess. Hey, okay, I'll take care of it. This woman got taken care of before she confessed. Now he just wants her to make a public uh, proclamation that Jesus healed her, not the doctors. How's that one? It wasn't a man with a PhD. It was the man that gave them the PhD. God, the brains, knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, and another one we read was Peter, Thou seest the multitude throng thee, and sayest thou who touched me? Now I don't know if you realize, but that's a remarkable passage. Especially when you dealt with the public, with a ministry. And you, you hear people come up to you, oh, I'm a Christian, I go to church. You hear all the lame blame excuses, don't you? So there's a lot of people elbowing, touching, feeling, knocking their knees, kicking. They're bumping Jesus. Many people do that. And yet, but if you come to Jesus by faith as one person of all the entire world, Jesus will stop and address you. How's that? These people are just blah, blah, blah. It's just a mass confusion. He calls it a press. It's a multitude of people. This woman comes up to him and he stops. Who touched? I want to know who that one person in this entire group is. I want to know who that woman is. And Peter's annoyed, but come on, Lord. 
You ever know the great things that happened in Jesus' life? The apostles are getting upset. Can we move on? Who touched you? I just got an elbow on my nose, Jesus. Come on. It was one of my ribs. And you're worried. Ow. Get out. Get out of here. Will you get away from me. Please, people. And you're worried about one person? Yes. Jesus is worried about one. I don't mean worried. But you know, Jesus is concerned about one person that came to him. Now, I don't know what God was doing in the afternoon of, of April 21st, 1987. But when I knelt down and asked him to save my soul, he stopped whatever he was doing and said, Oh, who just asked my son to save him? Let me see that book of life. Put that name down. Okay, angels, go ahead and rejoice. A new name has been written down. And what is Waterford, Connecticut to all God? who made all the universes and all the stars by name, and he stopped that one afternoon and said, I'm saving that soul. God will stop for one person that confesses. And he looked about to see her. So see, he knew who it was that had done this thing, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him told him all the truth come to God with all your truth don't come to him in a lie and he said unto her daughter Jewish there is a woman that is a Jew that has been bleeding 12 years that's important thy faith has made thee whole go in peace and be whole of thy plague 528 and Hebrews 11 6 now Jairus is biting his nails Wait, why are we stopping see Peter's like we're getting come on let's get out of this crowd let's get going Jairus said, my daughter's gonna die can, can, can you hurry up please all right all right you see you healed the woman let's go come on my daughter's gonna come on come Come on, Jesus. Come on. My daughter's dying. She's okay. Let's go. And while he yet spanked, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Now, that must be. He just watched this woman get healed and he gets news. Your daughter died. And they knew that he went for Jesus. Why troubles the master? And I believe that's the title of respect. Why trouble the master? You don't need to bring Jesus no more. We know why you went. She's dead. It's hopeless. Come home, be. Let Jesus be. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said, He saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Now he just told that woman in verse 34, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. And then he tells this gentleman, Only believe. Well, this is a lot more serious than bleeding. This is death. A father of a child. Only believe what? He said in verse 23, I pray thee come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. He's not believing in a resurrection. He believes he's going to, we just had a healing. You can do this, Jesus. Let's go. Leave the woman alone. Let's go heal my daughter. Your daughter's died. All because we stopped at this one woman. I don't know if that's what he's thinking. Some probably thought that. Had Jesus not stopped. And he suffered no man to follow him. Suffer means allow say Peter and James and John the brother of James so here's Peter James and John the, the trio 
And he cometh to the house of the ruler. He leaves everybody else right there. He tells the other disciples, nine. Yeah, nine disciples, stay here. Everyone, stay here. Takes the, the father, takes the servant, or whoever came from the house. Let's go. Let's go to your house. Kind of awkward. The rest of the disciples say, well, what do we do? He cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and sees the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. She's dead. The Bible tells us that she's 12 years old. 12 is the number of tribes in Israel. 12 is the division of the land of children of Israel. We just had a woman bleeding for 12 years. While this woman bled for 12 years, this, this little girl lived. And he realized that this girl died at the same moment that this woman was healed. When this woman healed, this little girl died. Now there's something to that. In Mark chapter 5. Could have, I did, it's just there's something in here about the twelve and I have not picked the fruit of that yet but there's something about it but these two women or girls females these two females have something in common and Jairus the ruler of the synagogue is in the center of this thing And Jesus Christ and you're going to see a remarkable statement here so they're all crying and making a big boo-hoo and when he was come in the house he saith unto them why make ye this ado and we John 11 35 records Jesus crying at a funeral of his best friend And he walks in this house and says, what are you guys doing? Why are you crying? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. Oh, what a change of attitude. They're now mocking Jesus Christ. The people that were in the house. The nation now is laughing and mocking while they're rejecting Jesus Christ in his works. Jairus isn't. He just seen what Jesus can do. He might be a little irritated too. They laughed him to scorn. Now anybody that laughed, now get, now get this now people, get this. Anybody that laughs at Jesus and rejects him, but when he had put them out, get out of here. Get away from me. When they had put them out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, Peter, James, and John, and entereth in where the damsel was lying Matthew 9 24 Luke 8 53 now this is a weird event coming up with the number 12 and he took the damsel by the hand so what's the first thing you do when you got a dead body in television And I know personally too that nurses will, will do it. When, when you got a dead body, they take the hand. And you're going to feel for a pulse. And then they go for the neck. But Jesus took her by the hand. And saith unto her, Talitha, come I. There you go. You want to learn Greek or Hebrew? There you go. Which is being interpreted, 
Damsel, I say unto thee, all right. There you go. You just got your Hebrew lesson for today. Or Greek. I don't even know which one it is. New Testament, so it's probably Greek. Now, don't you realize this this life actually? You realize I'm not giving no discredit to Jesus, all right? You realize how stupid that is to say she's dead. <laughs> Get up. Is it really that stupid? Did you you know what Martha said when Jesus told the Lazarus is coming out of that grave? Yeah, later, uh, you know, in the end of the wor world and all that. Yeah, he'll rise. Martha had that trouble. What we're doing right now. You notice the father and the mother never said anything. They're just staring there, looking like, okay. What do you think he's gonna do? He told her to get up. And it's never recorded any doubt. Remember, we learn, we perceive what the what the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes said in their hearts, and Jesus rebuked them. And we're not told nothing about these two. They're just sitting there, probably holding hands, with probably tears, watching Jesus as he just told her, "Arise." Can you just feel that lump in their throat and believe that she's going to get up? That lump in your throat of the one that is hope, Titus 2.13, the blessed hope. This man that's in this room holding our daughter's hand just told our daughter, get up. The whole world believes she's dead. And you just imagine if they're holding hand, they, they give that little grip in each other's hands of hope. And straightway the damsel arose and walked. For she, now watch this. For she was the age of 12 years. Why? Why are we told she's 12 years? Why is that? Here she isn't this great. She's dead. She's walking. She's talking. But she's 12 years old. There's something to that. And let me tell you something else. Who was in that room? Jesus. Peter, James, and John. The mother. And the father. Who was not in this room that witnessed it? Those that rebuked and those that scorned Jesus. They never saw it. And do you realize when this little girl went out to the well like Rebecca, they tended the sheep like Rachel. Do you realize when the, when the people of this city saw that girl in the street, it, they had no idea what happened and how it happened. They don't know what the words are. But there's that little girl. We were crying because she's dead. Now she's alive, and we laughed at Jesus, and you never saw it. And they were astonished with great astonishment. What on earth just happened here? So you got the faith, but you still got to say, you know, you ever pray for something, Lord, and, and he answers like, oh, okay, wow, yeah, Lord, I did I knew you would answer me, but I didn't realize you were going to answer me. Jairus was looking for healing. He wasn't looking for resurrection. You know what Jairus got that day? He got a better answer prayer than anybody would ever think to get. And this 12-year-old girl that we don't even know her name is one of the few examples of the people in the Bible who died rose from the grave and died again make a list of those people of the bible who died jonah is one of them though some people don't believe that they died they came back to life and they died again you know what's remarkable about jesus according to this story jesus died he arose from the grave and he'll never die again that's where it separates Jesus from man. I know he's man. I know he's 100% man. And you know what Jehovah's Witnesses say? He's not God. Yes, he is. He's 100% God. Because every man, even though they resurrected from the dead in the Bible, they went back to the grave. Jesus never went back to the grave after he arose. And there's something in here about Israel with that 12. And he charged them straightly, straightly, that no man should know it.
Well, they're going to see the li little girl walking and talking. You're not going to keep her in a closet. I would assume that it meant what happened in this room behind closed doors. But the problem is, do you believe Jesus Christ is your Savior? Do you believe in the Word of God? Let's read verse 41 again. And he took the damsel by the hand and said to Tabitha Kumai, by the second time, Miss which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Verse 43, and he charged him straightly that no man should know it. You and I know it. We just read it. We were told something that the people of this village were not told. How's that? By your belief and faith in Jesus Christ, you know something that the unbelievers, that the scorners will never know. Do you believe that? Then there you go. You know something that people didn't know who lived there in Jesus' time, who were with that damsel when she was dead, who saw Jesus, and Jesus escorted out of the room. You know something better than they know. You know the exact words of Jesus Christ. And if you got a modern Bible, that probably perverts that verse. If you got a modern Bible, it perverts what Jesus said. I got the exact words of Jesus that unbelievers do not have. And this is funny. And they commanded that something should be given her to eat. Do you know what caused her to die? I do. I know exactly what, what she died of. You see the Bible knows as it does. When Eve took that fruit and ate it. The wages of sin is death. She died because she was a sinner. He resurrects her. He tells her something that Genesis chapter 3 said. Eve ate the fruit. Give her something to eat. Give her some food. Now why he told her to eat something? I don't know. That's the source of our sin. Had Eve never eaten that fruit, we'd be all perfect today. That's a remarkable chapter in Mark chapter 5. 5 is death in the Bible. Number 5 is death. Some people may not believe that. I do. There is so much nuggets and fruit and grain and eating of Mark chapter 5. If you would pray and seek God, you get something out of that verse. Chapters. Verses. Verses. 